In the book of Genesis, we're taught that God created everything. But more importantly, we're taught the order of events that those things were created in. Now, science also has an explanation for where the world began and an order that the things were created in. And at first glance, they appear to tell two very different stories with very different timelines. But would you be surprised if I told you that they were, in fact, both telling us the same exact story? Would you be surprised if I could use science to prove the events of the biblical account were true? Is it possible to have the Big Bang and God too? Or are the two accounts fundamentally at odds with one another? If you stick with me, I think you'll be surprised. In this documentary, we'll be taking a look at the things that most people get hung up on, analyze the apparent contradictions between science and the Bible, and use science to validate what Scripture already tells us. I'm Michael Wilson, and this is the science behind the Bible. Why did the path of science and the Bible diverge? Satan caused a rebellion in heaven. Revelation 12 teaches us that Satan allied himself with one-third of the angels and made war in heaven. And then I witnessed in heaven another significant event. I saw a large red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, with seven crowns on his heads. His tail swept away one-third of the stars in the sky. And he threw them to the earth. Satan lost this battle and was cast down to earth, and in Revelation 20.10 we discover what fate awaits him at the end of this age. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, and will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Because of this, we are warned that the devil has come down with great wrath, for he knows that his time is short. Satan knows his fate, and he isn't happy about it. He wants to get back at God, but his direct assault on heaven was defeated, and he has no further direct recourse. So the only way that he can get back at God is through an indirect assault on us. Satan knows that God loves us so much that he gave his only son to die for our salvation. Satan therefore knows that the only way to truly hurt God is to hurt us. John 3.16 tells us that God would prefer that no one would go to hell, but that we would choose everlasting life through Jesus' free gift of salvation. But the sad reality is that not all will accept that free gift. Satan knows that if he can convince you to reject that gift of salvation, then he can take you with him to that lake of fire where you will be eternally separated from God. Now nothing could injure God more than that. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever shall believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And so since the dawn of time, Satan has persisted in his lies in an effort to deceive you into rejecting God's free gift of salvation. One of the best ways Satan can achieve this goal is to make you believe that the Bible is filled with contradiction and lies. Now, if any portion of the Bible is untrue, it would give you just cause to reject it entirely. The perversion of science and a misunderstanding of Scripture are key ingredients in the enemy's plan of deception. It's a common misbelief that scientists are, by far and large, atheists and unbelievers in the Bible. But a study by the Pew Research Center revealed that over half of scientists do believe in some form of higher power. So where did this idea that scientists are all unbelievers come from? It goes back to the enemy's plan of deception that we were just talking about. 
Satan has found a way to twist science into seemingly contradicting the Bible, and he uses a minority number of loud scientists to further that message. But the fact is, as scientists, we understand the mathematical truths dictating the order of the universe, and we recognize the impossibility of it all being some sort of cosmic accident. But to those who don't have a strong background in science, those concepts might as well fall into the category of black magic. It's something that they don't understand, and humans have a long harbored innate fear of the unknown. It isn't uncommon, therefore, for Christian believers to shy away from science out of a fear that they would somehow be wooed by its seemingly anti-biblical message. But nothing could be further from the truth. I find that the more I learn about science, the more it solidifies and justifies my faith. The Bible tells us a pursuit of science will lead straight to God. The heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship. Day after day they continue to speak. Night after night they make him known. They speak without sound or word their voice is never heard, yet their message has gone throughout the earth, and their words to all the world. This is one of my favorite passages in the Bible because it underscores the notion that we can use science to justify the existence of God. Here the Bible is telling us that the science of astronomy proclaims the glory of God. The night sky makes him known night after night, yet the world cannot hear their message. I love all the sciences, but astronomy is my favorite. I've been studying it since I was about five years old, and I'm telling you it is possible to train yourself to hear the message from the stars the Bible is telling us about. Now the Bible says the stars speak this message without words, which makes sense. We discover that the message is in fact spoken through the universal language of science. And indeed, just as the Bible says, science is a universal constant, a language that transcends all other language barriers, and is therefore the one type of message that is capable of spreading throughout all the world. This is our family nativity. Every year at Christmas time, countless families display something just like this in their home. Now, I like ours because the holidays can be such a busy time. I find it helps recenter my thoughts on the reason for the season. Here we see baby Jesus and Mary and Joseph. And look, the three magi have come to bring gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Only it didn't really happen that way in the Bible, did it? According to the Bible, the three magi did not arrive on the night of Jesus' birth. Perhaps you already knew this little piece of Bible trivia. If not, allow me to elaborate. In Luke 2, verses 8 through 20, it's revealed that shepherds, not magi, were abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock at night, when the angels appeared and made the announcement of Jesus' birth known. In verse 16, we see that it was these shepherds that came to Jesus that first night, not the Magi. We read about the Magi in Matthew chapter 2. The Bible says, There came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. There is nothing in the scripture to indicate that they were kings or that they were only three in number. The notion that there were only three of them probably comes from the fact that they bring three gifts. The star leads the Magi to Jesus, where it is said that they enter into the house, not a manger. In Luke, Jesus is referred to as a babe, but in Matthew, he's referred to as a young child. All of this indicates the Magi arrived after his birth, possibly several months afterward. So where did this common misconception about the manger scene come from? There's a well-established psychological phenomenon called the Mandela Effect, which occurs when a large number of people remember something differently than how it really occurred. And that's what's happening here. This actually happens several times throughout the Bible. The lessons many of us were taught in our Sunday school classes may not be 100% accurate when held to the standard of the scripture itself. In other words, it's possible things we think are true about the Bible, interpretations we've been told our whole lives, may actually be flawed when we actually start to analyze the scriptures. You may have heard that the fall of man occurred when Adam and Eve ate the apple. 
But the Bible refers to it as a fruit and never defines it as an apple specifically. And yet the apple appears throughout Renaissance art depicting the scene. I've even heard people attribute the phrase, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few to the Bible. But that's actually a quote from Star Trek. These are all examples of the biblical Mandela effect. The reason I'm telling you this is because Satan has been perverting science and our understanding of Scripture for a long time in an effort to undermine biblical credibility. Many of those lies are well founded in this Mandela effect. There are things that we think the Bible says about creation that are actually wrong. But don't take my word for it. I'll be citing everything directly from the Bible itself in an effort to finally break down these misconceptions. As long as you approach this with an open mind, I think you'll find the possibilities of what I'm suggesting to be really quite fascinating. By listening to the heavens, scientists have collected all kinds of data to support the notion that the Big Bang created the universe, but the Bible tells us that God created the universe. This is the single biggest apparent contradiction that so many just can't seem to get past. So we're going to start there. The book of Genesis is the primary source for the biblical story of creation, although it is quoted by Jesus and others in other locations as well. Let's look at the order of events according to the Bible and see how they stand up to the test of science. Beginning in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, we read, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep. Science also tells us the same thing. The universe began with nothingness. There were no stars. There was no light. All matter in the universe was contained within an infinitely small speck from which no light or radiation could be able to escape. The universe was indeed empty and formless. So it's a perfect match with what the Bible says. Let's continue. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. Then he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening passed, and the morning came, marking the first day. Science says the first stage in creation is the Big Bang, and that certainly sounds a lot like what the Bible is describing. God speaks light into creation, and a Big Bang would certainly generate a lot of light. So once again, it looks like a perfect match for what we read in the Bible. The law of conservation of mass and energy states that you cannot create something from nothing. God therefore speaks the universe into existence with the phrase, let there be light. He says it, and it happens. After this point, we will see that God forms and makes everything else from the ingredients which were spoken into existence here. The laws of physics state that the singularity which leads to the Big Bang could not explode because of the overwhelming force of gravity that held it together. In fact, the Big Bang is the only theory in, the, in science that is permitted to violate the laws of physics in order to make it work. Only an act of God could cause the Big Bang to occur. Scientists explain this by saying that the fundamental forces of nature, electromagnetism, gravity, and the strong and weak nuclear forces didn't exist prior to the Big Bang because the matter that they act on didn't exist yet. For example, it is said that the Higgs boson is the particle that gives other particles their mass. Well, the Higgs boson itself didn't exist prior to the Big Bang. Nothing did. So mass couldn't have ex existed either. And since it's mass that generates gravity, gravity couldn't have existed either. All of this allows for the early universe to do well, whatever it wants, because physics as we understand them today don't apply 
prior to the Big Bang. In other words, if God wants to speak a Big Bang into existence, that's no more unreasonable than the Big Bang exploding on its own for no apparent reason. Thus, science and the Bible are saying the same thing here. There was nothing, and then in an instant there was light. At this stage, the universe consists only of radiation, light, and the void into which it expands. Just as the Bible says, the light separated the darkness. Now we're told here that the Big Bang, or the creation of light, marks the first day. Science tells us that what happens next took far longer than a day. This is an apparent major discrepancy that we must reconcile. The first thing we must bear in mind is that God's word is true. God doesn't make mistakes. We also know that he created the laws of the universe and has informed us that listening to nature will reveal his fingerprints all over creation. We should, therefore, be able to use the sciences to support his word rather than undermine it. We must also recognize that some portions of the Bible are to be taken literally, while others are clearly figurative in nature. The dragon, whose tail collects a third of the stars we were talking about earlier, is an example of one of these figurative passages. In contrast, thou shalt not kill is an example of a passage that should be taken literally. So when the Bible talks about these events taking place in a day, is it speaking literally or figuratively? Let's see if we can figure this out. The mean solar day of a planet is defined as the amount of time it takes for the sun to rise, set, and appear again in its original location. On Earth, this takes 24 hours, but the length of a day is different for each planet in our solar system. Jupiter is 9 hours and 56 minutes, Uranus is 17 hours and 14 minutes, Venus is 116 Earth days in 18 minutes. Mercury is 176 Earth days, which is twice as long as its year. Its year is only 88 Earth days. Some people may even mistakenly define a day as the amount of time it takes for Earth to rotate once on its axis. This is in fact called the side reel day, and it's not even 24 hours. It's 23 hours and 56 minutes, four minutes shorter than most people think. Apparently, defining a day is going to be a little bit trickier than it might first appear. So what is the first day in the Bible? Since Earth has not yet been formed, nor the Sun for that matter, it is unlikely that we're referring to a 24-hour period. If these are literal days, then this creates a contradiction in God's Word, and as we've discussed, God doesn't make mistakes. So if our human interpretation of Scripture leads to a contradiction, then it must be our interpretation that is flawed, because it's impossible for God's Word to be flawed. So what could God be referring to here if not a literal day? Instead of saying day, perhaps we should think of these biblical days as steps in God's creation plan. In fact, the Hebrew word used here, yom, is used in several ways, sometimes in a 24-hour period, but also as a period of time of an unspecified length. For example, there are many passages in the Bible which refer to the day of the Lord. This usually refers to the period of time known as the end times and is obviously longer than a 24-hour period. So we see there is biblical precedent for the word day to be interpreted in other ways other than just a 24-hour period. The only other verse people use to support a literal interpretation of a 24-hour day in this context comes from Exodus 20 verses 8 through 11. When God gives Moses the Ten Commandments, he says, Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. This appears at first glance to be quite clear, but remember as of this first day of creation, the sun hasn't been created yet, nor the earth for that matter. So we can't have a day in the traditional sense yet. To understand this, we need only look at the manner in which Jesus taught others. 
Jesus favored the use of parables to get his messages across. A parable is defined as a simple story used to illustrate a moral or spiritual lesson. Remember the Bible makes it clear that Jesus is the human incarnation of God himself, so it makes sense that God the Father would also make use of this educational style. In this passage, God is most certainly teaching a lesson to his people. He is educating the people about his law, and he wants to make it quite plain and clear so that they will understand it. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8 states, But you must not forget this one thing, dear friend. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. This verse is not literally saying that God uses a calendar wherein a day on his scale is the equivalent of a thousand years on our time scale. The point being made here is that God exists outside of time. There is no past, present, or future to him. There is no linear time. He clearly states this in Revelation 22 verse 13 when he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Furthermore, he repeatedly backs up this claim by being able to predict future events with 100% accuracy. Clearly, God exists outside of time, so the notion that it took God any amount of time to do anything conflicts with the idea of his timelessness. This would create yet another contradiction. So the idea of a literal 24-hour day being used in the creationary process is creating huge issues with the totality of Scripture. God absolutely took a break from the creationary activities after creating the universe, and he wanted mankind to do so as well. It's a known fact that workaholics experience all manner of health issues related to stress, so a day off helps to ensure the health of his children. But more importantly, God knows that humans have a way of getting wrapped up in their own affairs and putting off God. Many Christians would be ashamed to admit how infrequently they read their Bible, and if that's you, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. The Sabbath ensures this does not happen by allocating a day exclusively for slowing down and spending time with God. Likening our own work to the work of God and even recognizing that God is entitled to a break validates the notion that we are entitled to a break as well. It's a parable, a story with a deeper meaning, just like the ones that Jesus so frequently told. By not limiting our interpretation to a 24-hour period, we can once again see that the Bible and science are both telling the same story. I know it's not what you were taught in your Sunday school class, but this interpretation does fit within the context of the rest of Scripture. It resolves all the contradictions that a 24-hour interpretation creates. There is biblical precedent for the word day to be referred to as an indeterminate length of time, and it reconciles one of the biggest problems the enemy is using to pit against science and the Bible. This is a huge concept. And then God said, Let there be a space between the waters to separate the waters of the heavens from the waters of the earth. And that is what happened. God made this space to separate the waters of the earth from the waters of the heavens. God called the space sky, and the evening passed and the morning came, marking the second day. According to science, after the universe cools, matter forms and starts to clump together. Most of the matter clumps in the center surrounded by smaller clumps that orbit it. One small clump will become the Earth, and others will become things in the sky, like sun, planets, etc. Both accounts mark a division of matter into two categories, Earth and all other stellar objects. There is a clear separation of space between them. What are these waters in heaven that the Bible is speaking about here? This is a curious phrase. The Hebrew word used here can only mean water, but obviously there is no liquid water in space. So what is the Bible describing here? 
Remember that the account of creation was given to Moses by God. Moses had a primitive mind by today's standards and no understanding of modern science and astronomy. Imagine God showing images of celestial phenomena to someone with no understanding of what he was seeing. Indeed, many supernova remnants resemble the caustics of water. Is it any coincidence that science theorizes the elements that make up our planet originated from a supernova remnant? This is an example of figurative language like we were talking about earlier. It is safe to assume we are not talking about literal water, but rather something that looks like water being described by a person who has no other frame of reference from which to base a comparison. Here we see the scientific account matching perfectly with what the Bible says happened on the second day. Then God said, Let the waters beneath the sky flow together into one place so the dry ground may appear. And that is what happened. God called the dry ground land, and the waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. Here we see the same waters we were talking about before flowing together to form the dry ground. Now obviously water can't flow together to form dry ground, so this further supports the notion that this isn't water but rather the dust from a supernova remnant. These types of nebula contain dust and gas that clump together under the force of gravity to form the rocky portion of Earth and the other planets. This process is called accretion, and we have documented evidence of it occurring elsewhere in space. So the question, can planets and stars form in this way, really isn't a question at all because we see it happening. We also see the land being separated from actual water, which God calls seas. Indeed, scientific evidence indicates the entire planet was flooded in its early history. Land appears only later after volcanoes poured out enough granite that would form the basis for the majority of the continents. Notice land is singular in the biblical account, whereas seas is plural. Scientists believe the first land consisted of a single landmass called Pangaea, and we have a tremendous amount of scientific evidence to support the notion that Pangaea existed in Earth's early geologic history. The idea that Moses, the person who wrote the book of Genesis 3400 years ago, could have any knowledge about Pangaea or that the land was originally a singular landmass is impossible to believe apart from the divine revelation of God. This helps prove the divine origins of the Bible. And then God said, Let the land sprout with vegetation, every sort of seed-bearing plant and trees that grow seed-bearing fruit. These seeds will then produce the kinds of plants and trees from which they came. And that is what happened. The land produced vegetation, all sorts of seed-bearing plants and trees with seed-bearing fruit. Their seeds produced plants and trees of the same kind. And God saw that it was good. And the evening passed and the morning came, marking the third day. Here we start to see the first signs of life. The Bible describes plants as appearing before more complex creatures like insects and animals. Science also tells us that plants preceded animal life. And so once again, we see science is supporting the order of events in the Bible on the third day. And then God said, Let lights appear in the sky to separate the day from the night. Let them be signs to mark the seasons, days, and years. Let these lights in the sky shine down on earth. And that is what happened. 
God made two great lights, the larger one to govern the day and the smaller one to govern the night. And he made the stars also. God set these lights in the sky to light the earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good, and the evening passed and the morning came, marking the fourth day. At first, this was a difficult one for me to explain. We appear to see the sun and moon being created after plants appear. But how could plants exist without sunlight? The New Living Translation and other translations reveal that the Bible doesn't necessarily say that God is creating the lights on day four, but rather that they seem to appear here. So what's the difference? Earth's early atmosphere was filled with volcanic gases. Early plant life filtered these gases to create the oxygen that we have today. This material from volcanic outgassing would have obscured the view of the sky. Notice that the sun and moon are not made here, they only appear here. They could not be clearly seen prior to the clearing of the sky. Clearly the sun was made prior to verse 14 because plants were introduced in verse 11 and plants require sunlight to photosynthesize. Thus we know that the plants could not have preceded the creation of the sun. Verses 16 through 18 are therefore what we refer to as parenthetical citations and they're very common throughout the, the Bible. Parenthetical citations such as these serve to provide further details about events that happened prior to the current event being discussed. Verse 16 clearly states that the sun, moon, and stars were not spoken into existence the way the Big Bang or first light was. Here the Bible says that God made them, indicating that a process took place. As we just talked about, science tells us that all celestial objects are created through the process of accretion, as we saw in verses 6 through 8 when God separates the water of heaven from the waters of earth. Matter was divided and combined together to create the earth and other celestial objects such as the sun, moon, and stars. The processes described by science are once again identical to the account of the fourth day. And then God said, Let the water swarm with fish and other life. Let the skies be filled with birds of every kind. So God created great sea creatures and every living thing that scurries and swarms in the water, and every sort of bird, each producing offspring of the same kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply. Let the fish fill the seas, and let the birds multiply on the earth. An evening passed, and morning came, marking the fifth day. Science tells us that higher life forms appear after plants finished filtering the atmosphere. The order is important here. Notice fish appear first, then birds. Cyanobacteria would have oxygenated the ocean first. Once saturated with oxygen, O2 molecules would have been escaping from the ocean into the atmosphere. With a more hospitable atmosphere, birds are created. Birds are directly related to dinosaurs, and thus we see them appearing prior to more complex mammals. This timeline is consistent with relative dating techniques conducted on fossil evidence. And once again, day five perfectly matches with the geologic record. And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creatures after its kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth after its kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after its kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creeps upon the earth after its kind. 
and God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make human beings in our own image, to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, and the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on earth, and the small animals that scurry on the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Indeed, science tells us that humans are the pinnacle of mammalian evolution, and are thus the last animals to appear in the fossil record. Here we can see the order of events described by the irrefutable evidence of scientific observation exactly coincide with the accounts of the Bible. Now think about this for a moment, and I can't stress how important this fact is. We have utilized the most advanced technology at our disposal to uncover evidence that led us to our current scientific explanation for the origins of the universe. Yet Moses wrote down the same explanation as early as 1445 BC. Do you know what this means? This is a form of reverse prophecy. Even though the events of creation happened in the past, we did not have the technology to understand them until now. How could a single man with no formal training or evidence arrive at the same conclusion as modern science today so perfectly, so exactly, only if the answer was revealed to him by God? John 14.29 has this to say about prophecy. I have told you these things before they happen so that when they do happen, you will believe. God told us where the universe came from, and now we have the technology to investigate the matter for ourselves, and we have come to the same conclusion that Moses told us 3,400 years ago. Why? So that we would believe. So we have now discovered that the scientific account of creation exactly matches the biblical account. The other big area that Christians and scientists get hung up on is evolution, so let's look at that one next. First of all, evolution and adaptation is absolutely real. We see it happening all the time. We see viruses mutate to adapt to vaccines. We see bacteria mutate to become resistant to antibiotics. And it's not just with microscopic creatures either. Darwin observed evolutionary adaptation within finches. And we see many species evolve new traits when they are separated from the rest of their population on remote islands. So we know that evolution happens. The question is, does it conflict with anything in the Bible? No. We just saw how the Bible lists the order in which the creatures were made, and it exactly coincides with what we see in the geologic record on which the theory of evolution is based. Wait. Wait. Let me stop you right there. It occurred to me while I was editing this that some of you may argue that while the larger macro evolutionary picture matches the Bible, it's actually the smaller scale changes that conflict with the Bible. In other words, science says that God created each animal after its kind, and the idea that a human extended from a monkey uh, doesn't seem to fit that. Okay, we've all seen this picture. But this is a simplistic rendering of what evolution is really all about. In practice, the evolutionary changes are happening on a very small scale. Let's look at those finches again. A finch doesn't just one day become an eagle, for example. It becomes a finch with a slightly longer beak or a slightly stockier build. As these changes start adding up slowly over time, we eventually might say, hey, this one's different enough that we should probably call it something else. But what the Bible says still applies. Each baby bird was a little different from its parent, but each one descended from its own kind. And the line of demarcation between where one species becomes another is in fact quite blurred. Now every now and again, uh, a lot of these small changes may add up all at once, or a mutation might creep in wherein a large change happens all at one time. But by far and large, we're mostly talking about small, subtle changes happening over a very long period of time. 
Now, if you're really headstrong about this, I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news. We as humans have Neanderthal DNA in our genetic structure, indicating that our two species shared a common ancestor. And if you've ever watched one of those forensic crime shows, then you know that it's really hard to argue against DNA evidence. Okay, back to the show. The only way you have a scientific conflict is if you hold to the notion that the events in creation happened over a period of seven literal days. And we've already discussed how the things I've suggested fit into the greater context of the Bible without conflict and even reconcile apparent contradictions that the 24-hour day interpretation creates. And we even discover that this interpretation even reconciles apparent scientific inconsistencies that Satan has been leveraging for decades to undermine God's credibility. This interpretation defeats those efforts of the enemy. One thing that is interesting is how the Bible describes the process by which animals were created. In Genesis 2.19, we're told, Out of the ground the Lord formed every beast. What makes this interesting is that it coincides with the scientific explanation as well. According to astronomers, there was a large star before our sun that went supernova, and this explosion created all the elements on the periodic table and scattered that dusty mess into space. Gravity then once again started pulling that material together, eventually forming the sun and the planets and all the other stuff that we talked about earlier. If we were to look at the elements in your, that your body is made of, out of, we would find the same elements present in the ground. You are indeed made from the very same elements as the dust of the earth, which in turn was made from this stardust that was left over from the supernova explosion. And the star that exploded came from the Big Bang that God created. The Bible could have said that God snapped his fingers and created man or beast from nothing at all, but it doesn't. It says that we were all created from the dust of the earth, exactly as predicted by science. Now, don't get me wrong here. God still made all the living things. I am convinced that if you put all of the building blocks of life together in a jar and shook it for a billion years or longer, and it still wouldn't even form a single cell. And even if it did, that cell would wouldn't be alive. The complexity of living things is too great to be an accident. God may have used natural processes to bring the pieces together, but I am convinced that those pieces only become alive because God willed it to happen. Indeed, Genesis 2-4 says that God breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Building blocks don't become alive without this direct intervention of God. If they could, then we would be able to reanimate people from the dead. When a person dies, all the elements of the living thing are still there. We should be able to replace the defective part and reanimate them. The fact that we can't is evidence that the breath of life that makes it all work has been removed. The process by which God assembles the dust of the earth into living things is not cited in the Bible. It just says that he did it. So when it comes to evolution, whether animals and people were created in an instant or evolved over time, neither one of those interpretations would undermine the text of the Bible in any way. So if we have evidence to support evolution on some scale and it doesn't conflict or undermine God's word, then why should we as Christians have have a problem with it at all. Now, I know what you're probably thinking. The idea of Adam evolving doesn't seem to fit with the biblical account, and you're absolutely right. But Adam and Eve are only one part of the story. Let's describe the origin of man next, and we'll see if we can reconcile this apparent problem with evolution. The notion that the universe is only 6,000 years old is one that has been circulating within the church for quite a while now, and it directly relates to our question about whether or not evolution is an anti-biblical concept. Let's start by looking at where this young earth idea came from and what science has to say about the age of the universe. 
Science says that the age of the universe is 13.8 billion years old and the age of the Earth is 4.6 billion years old. It is possible that errors in our calculations and errors in assumptions and methods which we use to arrive at these numbers are in fact wrong. In fact, these ages have been adjusted periodically throughout time as we make new discoveries, develop new technologies, and fine-tune our observations. But the idea that our observations are off by that kind of magnitude, uh, the difference between 6,000 and 4.6 billion years, the evidence just doesn't support anything like that. In Luke chapter 19, we see a multitude of disciples praising God, and the Pharisees want Jesus to tell them to be quiet. And Jesus answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. In other words, you can't silence the truth about God. If you attempt to do so, his creation will speak the truth in their stead. This verse is not unlike the account from Psalms where we see astronomy pointing us back to the Creator. We can use the rock and fossil history of Earth's geologic time scale to definitively prove the age of the Earth is older than 6,000 years. So where did this notion come from? And if it's based in biblical truth, how do we reconcile it with the evidence God has provided us within the geologic record of his creation? This chart depicts the 6,000 years of history depicted in the Bible. It lists everything that we know. For example, starting uh, here, this is today, and it goes all the way back to the birth and death of Christ. And then we also have many of these yellow lines are depicting the uh, descendants of Jesus. And so if we list all of the descendants going back all the way as far as they go, we get Adam and Eve at about 4,000 BC. So 4,000 years plus 2,000 years since Jesus' death gets us to the 6,000 year number. Now we know all of this because many of the people listed in the Bible, their ages are actually cited in the Bible. Um, and even sometimes it even tells us how old the person was when they had uh, their children. But not all of the time, so there is a little bit of guesswork in here, and that's why you see some overlap uh, between each of the yellow lines. So even if we were to stretch all of these out to the furthest extent possible whenever any guesswork was made, it still wouldn't even get you to 10,000 years. So somewhere between 6,000 and 10,000 is the absolute maximum that we could be, uh, but that still doesn't get you anywhere near the four and a half billion years established by science. Let me be clear, I'm a firm believer that the Earth is much older than 6,000 years old. The abundance of scientific evidence clearly proves that, but I have carefully researched this chart and it's legit. All of the information presented here was taken straight out of the Bible and the presentation appears to be pretty ironclad, but it conflicts with the geologic record. Remember, God tells us that we can use his creation to bring him glory, and science is the means by which we do that. If our interpretation of his word is out of sync with our interpretation of his creation, then one of our interpretations is flawed. It's unreasonable to think that God would build something into his creation that would intentionally confuse his people, so we must be missing something. All of this starts with Adam, so that's where we should start too. In Genesis 2, 7, we read that God formed man out of the dust of the earth. Now wait a minute, didn't we just see in chapter 1 that God created man? Most biblical scholars would explain this as one of those parenthetical citations we were talking about earlier. The idea is that in Genesis chapter 1, it gives us a broad illustration of the creation. And in chapter 2, we're going back in the timeline to provide additional details. That's certainly one way to interpret it, and probably the way that you were taught in your Sunday school class. But is there another interpretation, one that could fit both the geological timeline but also not conflict with any other area of the Bible? Remember, we can and should reject any interpretations that create inconsistencies or contradictions in the Bible. 
I'm going to offer you one possible explanation that at first will sound totally unreasonable. It will seem like it's in direct conflict with numerous other verses in the Bible. But we'll address each one of these apparent conflicts and ultimately find that this solution does fit. So stick with me. What if Adam wasn't the first human on earth? Ridiculous, right? I mean, we read about his creation right here in Genesis 1 and 2. We read about how there was no companion for him, so God created one. Clearly, that's the only way we can interpret this, right? Now stick with me here. Let's just pretend that Adam wasn't the first human created. If humans started before Adam, then it matches the geologic and archeological evidence that science provides us. Let's see if we can figure this out. First of all, it's clear that God created Adam and Eve and that they did not evolve from other life forms. If other humans existed prior to Adam, perhaps they evolved. But we've already seen how God created Adam in Genesis 2 verse 7 through supernatural means. And now we see in verse 21 and 22 that his wife Eve is created from one of Adam's ribs. We are also told in chapter 2 that God miraculously creates the Garden of Eden for Adam and Eve to live in. In chapter 3 verse 6, they eat from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and are cast out of Eden. In chapter 4, Eve gives birth to two sons, Cain in verse 1 and Abel in verse 2. We do not hear of any other children being born until after Cain kills Abel. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. In chapter 25, we're told that Eve gives birth to a new son named Seth, specifically to replace Abel. The order of the events that happen here is very important. In chapter 4, we're told about the birth of Cain and Abel. At the end of chapter 4, we're told about the birth of Seth. Then in chapter 5, we are once again told about the birth of Seth. But we're also told some key information about Adam himself. And Adam lived a hundred and thirty years, and begot a son in his own likeness after his own image, and he called his name Seth. So once again, we're told again about the birth of Seth. And the days of Adam after he had begotten Seth were eight hundred years, and he begot sons and daughters. So we aren't actually told about any other sons and daughters being born until after Seth is born. So we are told when Cain, Abel, and Seth are born in verse 4, the birth of Seth is again mentioned, but we are not told about Adam having additional innumerable children until after the birth of Seth. This is important because after Cain kills Abel, God exiles him in Genesis 4.12, and he is thereafter referred to as a fugitive and a wanderer. And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hidden, and I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer in the earth. And it shall come to pass that any one that finds me shall slay me. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. Okay, so just to recap here, if we're to believe the traditional interpretation we were told in our Sunday school classes, then Adam, Eve, Cain, and Abel are the only people on earth. Seth isn't born until after Abel dies, and the Bible clearly says that other children aren't born until after Seth is born. So at this point, Cain just killed Abel, so Seth and other children don't exist. God exiles Cain for his crimes, and yet Cain is for some reason concerned about other people killing him. Now here's the real kicker. We read in the very next verses, 16 and 17, that Cain settles in the land of Nod, where he and his wife have a son named Enoch. Who is Cain's wife and where did she come from? Cain goes on to build a city named after his son Enoch. Now you can't have a city with only three people. It looks like the traditional Sunday school interpretation where Adam and Eve are the first and only people on earth doesn't actually fit with the other verses of God's word. 
Even if we ignore these contradictions and buy into the notion that these other people are in fact the descendants of Adam and Eve, even though the Bible clearly said such descendants don't exist yet, then Cain marrying and presumably populating his city with his sister wife also doesn't make sense. Cain is supposed to be a fugitive from his people. He should be living in exile from his family, not marrying them. This would fly in the face of the punishment that God levied against him for the murder of his brother. Now, this is unacceptable. If an interpretation is causing this much conflict with God's word, then that interpretation is wrong, and clearly this interpretation of Adam and Eve being the first and only people on earth is creating a lot of contradictions. But if Adam and Eve aren't the first people on earth, doesn't that create contradictions too? Actually, no. Now I know, I know it sounds absurd, but let's really look at this again through that lens and I think you'll see that all the problems that we just discussed actually get resolved and no new problems arise. Hear me out and I'll walk you through it. And what if Adam were not the first human on earth? If that's the case, then all of this is explainable and all of the apparent contradictions are eliminated. Cain could simply marry one of the many people that are already on earth and the city could be populated with those people as well. Cain would continue to live in exile consistent with God's punishment. But if Adam isn't the first human, then why did God go through all the trouble of creating him in this miraculous way? Why didn't Adam's story simply begin as the child of one of those people who evidently already existed? Remember, God knows the beginning from the end. From the very beginning of time, God had a plan that would ultimately culminate with the death of Jesus and his eventual triumphant return. Remember also that Luke chapter 3 gives us the genealogy of Jesus dating all the way back to Adam. So Adam is an important part of Jesus' history. In Matthew chapter 1 we also see the genealogy of Jesus, but this time it only dates back as far as Abraham. More importantly, the genealogies in Matthew and Luke appear to be different from one another. Between Abraham and David, the two accounts are identical, but then it branches off into two completely different directions. Remember, God impregnated Mary, so Joseph is technically Jesus' stepfather. Setting that aside, we can see in Luke that Joseph is the son of Heli, but in Matthew we are told that Jacob begot Joseph. Now, at first glance, this appears to be a contradiction, but remember again that there can be no contradictions in the Bible because God doesn't make mistakes. Indeed, most biblical scholars agree that Matthew's account is referring to the true genealogy of Joseph, Jesus' father, because it specifically says that Jacob begot Joseph. In Luke, we are not told that Heli begot Joseph. The Bible simply says that Joseph is the son of Heli. So how can one man have two fathers, one that begot him and one that did not? It makes sense if Heli was Joseph's father-in-law. So the genealogy in Luke is actually following Mary's bloodline back to Adam, not Joseph. So between Matthew and Luke, we have the genealogy of both of Jesus' parents. For our purposes, Mary's bloodline is the most important because remember, God is Jesus' true father. But Mary is still the mother either way, so tracing Mary all the way back to Adam gives us a direct link between Jesus and Adam. Now why does this matter and what does it have to do with Adam being or not being the first man? Deuteronomy 14.2 tells us that the Hebrews are God's chosen people. For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God, and the Lord hath chosen thee to be a peculiar people unto himself above all the nations that are upon the earth. So something is clearly unique about this nation. 
how does one differentiate between one nation and another? Is it simply your religious beliefs or is it the political borders on a map or is it something that runs much deeper? It's clear the Jews believed this was something you had to be born into because in Ephesians, Paul had to explicitly make it clear to the people at the time that the Gentiles, that is non-Jews, are also fellow heirs and partakers in the promises of Christ. So up until the arrival of Jesus, the Jewish people were set apart in God's eyes. In Genesis 12, we read about what is commonly referred to as the Abrahamic covenant, where this idea of the Jewish nation being uniquely set apart unto God is formally established. But remember from Mary's genealogy that Abraham is a direct descendant of Adam. And so we see that this unique nature of the Jewish people actually starts there. God miraculously created a lineage of people, the Jewish nation, whose bloodline was unique from any other people that may have existed in the world. And it was this unique bloodline that Christ, the Savior of all nations, ultimately descended from. It is this interpretation that allows us to ultimately fully realize why the Jews are referred to as God's chosen people. Understanding their origin from this miraculous creation of Adam truly separates them from the Gentile nations who already lived on the earth. And it helps us understand the magnitude of God's plan for Jesus and just how unique he and his ancestry truly is. This concept of biblical genealogies is actually quite interesting from a genetic perspective. All humans inherit half of their genes from their mother and the other half from their father. But something special happens with men. The Y chromosome is what determines gender. If you're male, then you'll inherit an X chromosome from your mother and a Y chromosome from your father and express a masculine phenotype. If you're female, you'll inherit two X chromosomes instead, one from your father and one from your mother, and you'll express a female phenotype. Since the Y chromosome only comes from your father, it does not combine with anything from your mother. Therefore, the Y chromosome remains fundamentally unchanged from one father to the next. We call this a paternal haplogroup, and it can be used to trace our genealogical lineage through our father's line. Now, genetic testing didn't exist in the time of Jesus, but if it had, it would have been interesting to sequence Jesus' DNA because genetically speaking, Jesus' father was God himself. Setting that aside, most of the genealogies in the Bible trace through the father's line. Women seem to be introduced only very rarely. That theoretically means as long as the Jews didn't marry outside of their nation, then the Y chromosome was passed throughout the lineage of the Jewish people all the way from Adam down to Jesus. Eventually, however, genetic mutations do occur and a new paternal haplogroup begins. So from a scientific perspective, every time a new paternal haplogroup is initiated, a new nation is born, set apart and unique from all others. It's just that in the case with Adam, it happened through miraculous means rather than a genetic mutation. So at first glance, this seems like great news. It appears that we have finally reconciled science and the Bible. But remember this idea of Adam not being the first human on earth only works if other places in the Bible don't conflict with it. In fact, there are a few areas other than Genesis that mention Adam, which at first glance appear to completely undermine the theory. Let's look at those and see if we can refine our interpretation until all the biblical contradictions are eliminated. Eve does not get her name until Genesis chapter 3, verse 20. Prior to that, she's simply referred to as woman because she was taken out of man. Adam finally gives her the name Eve, which literally means life giver. But the Bible says Adam called her that because she is the mother of all living. This would appear to indicate that Eve really was the mother of all humanity, and other humans did not therefore exist at the time. 
But as we've seen, the ability of Cain to take a wife and establish a city prior to the birth of Seth or the mention of any other siblings appears to be in conflict with this idea. Our suggestion that Adam was not the first man allows for the existence of other people and eliminates this inconsistency. But how do we address this verse where Eve is referred to as the mother of all living? This statement happens immediately after the expulsion from Eden, before Cain and Abel are born. So at this point, Eve has not even given life to anyone, but God has just made the announcement that she would be capable of childbirth, and that as part of her punishment for eating the fruit, her pain in childbirth would be multiplied. So Adam knew that she would be the life giver. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Remember also that at this time that Adam gives her this name in verse 20, they are receiving word of their punishment, but won't actually be exiled from Eden until verse 24. While they remained in Eden, they were cut off from the rest of the world and apparently unaware of the existence of any other people that may have been on earth. Thinking they were the only people, it makes sense why Adam would have said this and phrased it in this way. First Corinthians 15 verses 45 through 46 states, And so it is written, The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last, Adam, was made a life-giving spirit. Taken out of context, this makes it sound like the Bible is clearly reiterating the notion that Adam was indeed the first man. But when one understands the context, we realize that we really aren't talking about Adam at all. This passage begins in verse 35. But some men will say, how are the dead raised up, and with what body do they come? This is the question that Paul is answering. So this isn't really about Adam being or not being the first man at all. It's about what happens to us when we die. For the next 10 verses, Paul describes how we are raised from the dead with a glorified body. In this sense, we have two bodies. The first one, the earthly body, which will eventually die, and the second one, which will defeat death and live forever in heaven. So when verse 45 talks about Adam being the first man, what we're actually referring to is the first of two men, the earthly man that will pass away. The last Adam is the second man that rises as a glorified heavenly body. The New Living Translation of the very next verse, 46, makes this point very clear. What comes first is the natural body, then the spiritual body comes later. And that's it. Those are the only passages in the Bible that would seem to be in conflict with the notion of Adam not being the first human. And we have reasonable explanations for each that do not create other contradictions elsewhere in the Bible. This is the only explanation, therefore, that eliminates the apparent contradictions of Cain's wife, the conflict of the geologic time scale that clearly indicates the earth is older than 6,000 years, and remains consistent with the genealogical timeline outlined throughout the Bible. This interpretation has powerful ramifications in the sense that we now see Moses' account of creation coincides perfectly with 3,500 years of accumulated scientific evidence which Moses could not have been privy to by any other means other than divine inspiration. All of this serves to scientifically validate the Bible which, as predicted in Psalm 19, means that we can use science to proclaim the glory of God. Piecing this interpretation together has been the culmination of a 23-year-long Bible study on this topic. I truly believe the Lord guided my research and answered my questions all along the way, and I fully expect to receive all manner of backlash from both the biblical and scientific communities as the enemy seeks to hold on to this valuable tool of deception that he has abused for so long. 
I encourage you to send this message to those you think would benefit from it, and I hope that it will serve to strengthen and solidify your faith in our Lord as we finally learn to embrace and understand the full magnitude and complexity of his creation. This was a long message. If you haven't considered yourself a believer in the Bible up to this point, but you made it through to the end, it tells me that some part of you is curious about God, and I hope that this message has revealed just how amazing the Bible is, how it accurately predicted scientific processes that have taken humanity 3,400 years to build. That is nothing short of a miracle, and I hope that that realization is starting to set into you. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says the average person can't receive these truths from God's Spirit. It all sounds like foolishness to them and they can't understand it. For only those who are spiritual can understand what the Spirit means. If you've ever tried to read the Bible and just don't understand it, that's what this verse is talking about. The Bible might as well be encrypted in some type of code. You must first take a step of faith in order to be able to unlock it. Call out to God. Do it right now. Say this prayer. Lord, I'm ready. I want to learn more about you. I realize that you're real and I accept that Christ died for my salvation. And after a lifetime of running, I'm ready to let you in. Guide me in my walk from this day forward. Amen. As soon as you utter those words, God will fill you with his Holy Spirit and unlock the mysteries of the Bible to you. You'll be able to understand it for the first time in your life. And the more you pursue him, the greater your knowledge will become and the more your faith will grow. More importantly, as you utter these words, your name will be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You'll be cleared in the eyes of God of any wrongdoing you've ever committed, and you'll finally gain access to eternal life in heaven. It's that easy. Utter that prayer and accept his free gift of salvation. If you did it, if you said that prayer, I want to be the first to welcome you into the family of God. Please leave a comment below to let me know that you were saved this day so I can pray for your new walk. I encourage you to immediately find a good church or join a Bible study before the enemy has a chance to spoil your enthusiasm. Your brothers and sisters in Christ will help build you up and be able to answer many of the questions you'll no doubt have along the way. Again, I say welcome to the family. We're glad you're here.